been actually working in the AI space on and off uh, probably over the last 20 years or so, but it's actually not AI. I mean, as you would know, it's, it's kind of, I'm, I'm a trained mathematician turned into computer scientist. So uh, deep inside AI, the techniques, the methodology is actually uh, computer science and, and, and statistics and especially mathematics. So I've been kind of involved in AI space uh, a bit, but more, more particularly, more recently, I've been actually working on uh, face recognition, which Professor McIntyre also highlighted. So I'll be talking quite a bit about faces, face recognition, because I think it's an important kind of example to highlight some of the advances that we have actually made in AI and also some of the pitfalls, some of the dangers of actually applying AI and using AI without understanding it. And this is exactly what I want to kind of explain to you. So I will start with um, a, an interesting example. So if I show a face, now this is a face. Now if I show a face, this a face like this, and I ask you who this is, <clears throat> you might be able to somehow guess this person. Now you might, if I give you a hint, you might say, uh, if I give you a hint, is this um, Marilyn Monroe? Uh, you might say, yeah, probably there's some, some characteristic of Marilyn Monroe in this face. Now, if I put Albert Einstein in there, you might think actually Einstein is also in there because in fact, this is an AI generated face, which is actually a blend of the two. So the interesting thing here is if I did a face recognition, a, a standard face recognition, which we should use in immigration scenarios or other scenarios, if I actually apply the face recognition algorithm on this and then see that what, how, what, how similar it is the middle face to the the two faces, uh, uh, Monroe and Einstein, what I'm getting is very interesting. So it's 81% uh, Monroe, 86% uh, Einstein, but between obviously between Einstein and Monroe, there's 41%. So obviously a face recognition will fail if you put into uh, two, the, the two faces, Monroe and Einstein. But if you put this face, it will say this is Einstein as well as Monroe. So this, is, this, this becomes an interesting question, an intriguing question, because if Einstein and Monroe are alive today, they can have one single passport that they can they can carry around if this passport gets approved, by the way, the process goes through, if this it gets approved, they can carry this around and Einstein can travel uh, using this passport at the same time Monroe can travel. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter that it's, it's regardless Einstein, it can be you and me, it can be anybody. So if we can do this process, we can actually uh, basically fool an AI system or, or a face recognition system in this process. So this becomes kind of worrying in, in, in some senses because this is being integrated into many, many forms and, 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 and it, uh, face recognitions everywhere and it's very, very powerful as well. So as I mentioned, AI has actually accomplished um, amazing feat. Again, here's another, another example to actually explain how powerful this AI is. This is uh, an experiment that we have been doing in our lab. We, we, we are looking at partial face recognition. So how powerful are face recognition systems based on partial data? Say it could be a CCTV, grainy CCTV image of somebody's eye. Now, if I present these two images to you and say, is this the same person? You probably might struggle because you don't know because I mean, it's, it's very two different uh, um, faces or parts of the face. In fact, humans are very good in recognizing faces through the eyes. But I think people will actually struggle to identify whether this is the same person. In fact, AI, our system actually identifies this to be the same person 80% of the time. Anything above 70% means it's a, it's a match, it's an identity match in our system. So that shows how powerful the system is in actually recognizing faces uh, in, in, in many instances. I want to also talk to you um, a little bit about some of the kind of high profile cases we've been working on using these face recognition systems. So I want to give you an, an example. So this particular example is to do um, uh, with the uh, Salisbury poisoning in 2018. You probably will have it's an international story. So one day I received an email from Bellinka, uh, the online investigator with these two images. And they asked me the question whether this is the same person. Now it wasn't it wasn't too difficult a task for me because all I had to do is run this through my face recognition system and then my face recognition to system told me around ninety percent you know high on the high nineties that this is the same person so obviously it is the same person from a facial recognition point of view and we were able to kind of solve this this problem in fact these um, uh, the two images here are presented as two individuals with two passports 
uh, holding two passports, but they're the same person. Um, uh, so so the, the point I, I like to make is that these systems are very, very powerful and it can be used for good uh, to identify uh, criminals, uh, to solve crimes and things like that. But also there are things that we need to really understand in this, I think, uh, before we go any further in actually creating these complex systems. So the point here is that many people talk, most, many people talk about AI. I think people need to also understand what AI does and how AI has evolved over the years and what is it actually is doing. Machine learning, people talk about, there are different terminologies, machine learning, artificial intelligence, neural networks. So what are these? And I think it's important for us to kind of understand that a deep inside a little bit uh, to be able to kind of make judgments and utilize it in, in a good way. So modern AI, I mean, AI has existed for 50 years or, 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 or more even, but modern AI is really about deep learning. Deep learning, I mean, uh, it's, it's a keyword that many people talk about and many, many, many people know about it. So deep learning is to do with actually understanding how human human brain works or the neuron structure in human brain works and utilize that in a, in a machine form. So for example, if I show a three-year-old an apple, now the three-year-old will learn about the apple very quickly. I just have to show probably just one apple and say, this is an apple. Now I don't have to show a green apple or a red apple or any other apple, any kind of, I can just show one apple and the, the three-year-old actually understands what an apple is. Now that's a very powerful way of actually understanding about it. What the three-year-old is not doing is actually classifying apples from green apple to red apple. What the three-year-old is, is understanding the actual apple, the characteristics, the features, the texture and things like that. Based on that, uh, the three-year-old actually understands what an apple is. Whereas the machine does it in a slightly different way. So I think this is where we need to start also understanding how the machine does it. So, so that's how kind of deep learning essentially works in a, in a nutshell. But if you go, it's, it's, as I said before, it's actually based on the neuronal structure of the kind of human brain as, uh, as pointed out here. Uh, so, uh, and if you, if, you, if you think about it, basically it's, it's a black box where you, you feed in data and inside the data, there is a system which essentially optimizes these weights and inputs and things like that, these weights, and then essentially it creates a structure. Now this goes back to 1950s, uh, uh, and, and, and people have actually utilized this idea to actually create complex systems. So that's essentially kind of how, how it works. Now, this system has been existing for a long time, as I said before, but 2012 was a good year for deep learning or artificial intelligence. I think it's from 2012 on, people have really started talking about it because there was a challenge where ImageNet actually solved a huge challenge of 15 million labeled images, 22 categories, and they were asked to actually recognize, uh, create an algorithm to recognize those images. And it was a deep learning algorithm. It, um, they uh, it was Jeffrey Hinton's team who did this piece of work and the, the error rate was 15.3%, which was never heard of at that time. And it was, a, it was a great time for deep learning and AI. And that's how it all got kind of started. And everyone, everyone is talking about deep learning. Essentially, if you talk about AI, it's deep learning. So that was good. So how does, uh, I'll, I'll just put, put back again, how does uh, deep learning work, as, as I said before? So I'll take the example from faces. So here's the example. So what you do is you throw these data, uh, if it's face recognition, you throw laws and laws of images into this thing, uh, which is a structure you can imagine. So you, you throw different types of images. So in the case of face, face recognition, you keep throwing these images and it goes through different layers and it identifies the face. It actually looks at the uh, color space, the, the texture space, various statistics on the face, and it actually classifies the face very accurately. In fact, in this particular case, each human face is, uh, you know, represented by 128 floating point numbers. 128 floating point numbers are enough to actually represent each human face up to identical twins in, in some sense. So in a, in a sense, it's very, very powerful. But there's a deep question here. How did they come up? How did the algorithm come up with those 128 numbers? And what are the actual significance of those 128 numbers? The answer is nobody knows. It just comes up with these 128 numbers and it's very good in most of the experiments, 99% of the experiments that you do, it actually comes up with accurate, accurate answer. So does that make it accurate 100%? No. So, and also, do we actually know what these 128 numbers are? 
So those are kind of questions that actually stays. And, and we have done this sort of work where we, we looked at partial faces. Uh, we, we were looking at, as I said before, how different parts of the face actually reacts to uh, to the face recognition. And we found out that you know only top half or, or half of the face is actually enough for us to actually recognize somebody um, purely, it's, it, as I pointed out in the previous example. And it's very relevant to this day because we are working on this sort of uh, data now where face recognition needs to be kind of reworked so that uh, faces are recognized using using masks too so the point is we have we have a system like this and it's it's not this is kind of you know ai and it's not fully transparent because there's a black black box there there's a lot of things that happens in it and the question is how does the, the learning take place in there what type of learning is it i mean surely it's not the way humans learn uh, because it goes through a certain uh, certain strategies and things like that it doesn't actually so so it's not how humans look and how does it actually decide on these various functions in this black box which is which is not known at the moment so there is a big question mark in in terms of kind of the transparency of this black box you know how how do you do it here is a very simple example um so in this example there's a panda uh, uh from a, a huge image set and it is 57.7% confidence, this, this particular algorithm that is a panda. So all, all, all we do is we add a small white noise or some, some sort of a noise, just basically mix those two pictures together. And then output comes a visually recognizable panda, obviously, but in the case of the algorithm, the algorithm says 99.3% confidence level is a given. So you can see, we don't actually know how this algorithm actually worked this out. Clearly it's wrong, but all you added was a simple basic image to the original image and it goes all wrong. So these are questions I think um, that we need to kind of think about it. Here's another example from a very well-known face recognition algorithm called FaceNet, which is available on the internet. You can download it, you can use it. If you put in these two images, obviously these are not the same pe people. Oh, okay, they are related very much. But if you to put in those two images, the, the face net will come as 85% similar. Both. So a face recognition system will actually fail in this case. So these are kind of key questions, I think, that we need to kind of um, um, understand and, and, and also explain. So the current, current AI structure or, or the deep learning structure that we call AI uh, is this. You have, a, you have an input and then you have a black box and inside the black box, there are many things that you need to explain. So the ML model is in the middle and then you make a decision. So what happens in the ML model is actually not. So we need to actually open this box and try and understand where. So there are the, the proposed model for this is you have the model and then you have an explainable component on top of that. And after that, you, you make a decision. So this explainable component needs to come in and people are talking, already started talking about how and what form this explainable model will be. So the explainable model it should itself should say, why and how uh, are we trustworthy? You know, is, is this success and failure profile? What is this? What is the error correction? So all these questions needs to be ticked before we can actually say this model is foolproof. And I think this is one direction where AI is heading. And I think we will be actually doing quite a lot of technical work as well as um, other important work in this area of explainable AI. I, I didn't want to talk too much about the actual methods because I, I uh, um, it's, this is not the place to actually talk about technical stuff. But I think it's important for us to highlight that model creation and that standard input output decision is not enough. We need an explainable model on top of each of the models. So every face recognition algorithm must come up with an ex explainable model. Every diagnostic system uh, that we use uh, must come up with an explainable model, which is easier to understand and, and, and inferable by humans. And I think that's where I would stop. Thank you very much.